Well, that being said, can we go to backbeat about me? I mean, <laughs> uh, we are, you're now looking live. We're at the House Economic Matters Committee. Today is Wednesday, February 10th. We, uh, what's the bill before? Senate Bill what? Anybody? 496. 496. Senate Bill 496, the Relief Act. What I'd like to do, uh, first of all, welcome Delegate Lukey. It's, it's good to have you in committee. If you could walk us, just explain what the bill is. And then I believe we have uh, staff from DLS. They'll take any questions from the members. So I would ask the members if you could just sort of mark down yeah. what section it was in. And, and that way we can get through the bill. Uh, DLS can uh, answer any questions you may have to the best of their ability. And then we will be voting after that. And without further ado, Delegate Lukey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so first of all, thank you for letting me join Club ECM temporarily um, for your voting session. So this bill is, is the product of a lot of hard work. And I, I want to take a second um, and, and say thanks um, to uh, your staff, uh, Laura, who's worked closely with our staff on Ways and Means, with the Speaker's staff, um, the Comptroller's staff, the Governor's staff, Senate staffers. There have been a lot of people who deeply involved in this. Um, as the bill was originally introduced by the governor, it created about a billion dollars in uh, various programs, uh, mostly through tax law, uh, intended to help individuals and small businesses that have been severely impacted by the pandemic. The Senate uh, it continued many of the governor's programs, but added to it about $520 million worth of spending, uh, which was distributed through a, a series of different programs. Um, the House convened a, a small work group uh, consisting of myself, uh, a, a couple of members of my, my subcommittee, the Revenue Subcommittee, as well as, as Delegate Kerry, because of the components related to ECM, um, and uh, developed a, a House position on the bill. Um, the amendments you have before you are amendments that have now been negotiated uh, between the House and the Senate and the Governor. Um, and I'll walk you through what the amendments would do. We're working off the Senate version of the bill. Um, so I'll try to take it step by step for you. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, we're going to start with some of the, the more individual, uh, the components of the bill that are focused more on, on individuals. Um, so the bill as introduced um, had a proposal to uh, permanently exempt all unemployment insurance from taxation. Unemployment insurance payments are taxed as a result of the 1986 Reagan tax reforms. The reason for that has to do with tax policy. It's a basic principle of tax policy that you treat income as income. Um, now, obviously, we've seen this huge spike in uh, access to the unemployment system because of the pandemic and the recession. Um, and so what the Ways and Means Committee um, had recommended on the tax side of this was to um, allow taxpayers who uh, had UI benefits in 2020 and 2021 to essentially not pay taxes on those benefits, to deduct those benefits, but then to end the benefit after that. Now, a future legislature could continue it if they so wished. Um, we also um, to apply what's called means testing to it, to say that if you made more than $75,000 as an individual uh, or $100,000 as a joint filers that you wouldn't be eligible for the deduction. Um, we did these things in part to uh, reserve funding for other things that we wanted to do in the bill. Um, the, the speaker asked us relatively early on to develop a proposal that was focused as much as possible on people who had need, on alleviating the, the uh, increasing inequality and poverty that we've seen as a result of this, um, and on small businesses that were in need. In order to do that, we proposed significant changes to uh, the earned income tax credit. So the earned income tax credit is another program that dates back to the 1986 Reagan tax reforms um, and actually is a program which has been widely popular on both sides of the aisle. Um, it's a tax credit, uh, refundable tax credit uh, for people that, that earn income, so actual workers. So it encourages people to work and it provides additional support to people that are low income workers. Um, the governor's original proposal sought to provide some individual relief by providing a one-time check for anybody who qualified for the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, in 2019 of $500 for a family, $300 for an individual. And then a second one-time check for anybody who qualified for the 2020 EITC 
for $250 for a family. And I believe it was $150 for an individual. Um, the amendments that Ways and Means approved earlier today would retain the governor's proposal for the 2019 tax year. So anybody who qualified for their earned income tax credit in 2019 would receive a check for um, $500 for a family. Um, two, the three, was it 250 or 350, George? So, sorry, $300 for individuals, $500 right. Right. for families. Uh, but then we would um, increase the refundability percentage, the match that Maryland does to the federal refundable earned income tax credit from 28% to 45% for anybody with dependents. And for individuals with file without uh, dependents, we would increase it to 100%. So what does that mean um, from a practical perspective? So I'll give you two examples. For a family uh, who has two or more children, who's working, doesn't make a lot of money, makes about $25,000 a year. If they qualified for the EITC, if they made that same amount for uh, 2019 and the next three tax years, uh, they would get $500 immediately in a check for 2019. For qualifying for the 2020 EITC, they would get about $1,100. And then $1,100 again the next year and $1,100 again the next year. A family would get about $4,000 over the next three years. A future legislature could seek to make those EITC changes permanent if they wanted to. Uh, for an individual um, who currently under the federal EITC gets about $540 uh, because we're matching, we would match it at 100%, they would also get $540 a year. Um, and again, I'm happy to walk through a lot of the research around the EITC and why this is a particularly good move both for encouraging people to work and for helping support working families. Um, on the uh, business side of things, so there's a couple of provisions that were in the original Hogan proposal that have survived uh, in exactly the same form from the uh, through the Senate and now in through the House amendments. One of them would exempt from uh, taxes any forgiven loans uh, as a result of forgiven loan and grant or loan and grant programs related to the pandemic. Um, normally, forgiven debt is taxed, uh, so we're essentially saying that you know these pandemic relief programs we're not going to tax that forgiven debt. Um, there's also a pr provision that has to do with MISBIDFA, uh, which you may be aware is a, a semi-independent authority that helps promote uh, minority-owned businesses. Because they're a semi-independent authority, um, we, uh, the governor proposed, and we will continue providing them with authorization to uh, turn some of the loans they made into grants up to $50,000, which is equivalent to what uh, the governor did through his executive orders, but MISBIDFA needs specific statutory permission to do it. And then uh, let me talk about the two largest small business economic relief programs in the bill. The first of them uh, came originally from the governor's proposal and it's, what it's called a sales tax vendor credit. And what, it would mean, what a sales tax vendor credit means is that a business that collects sales taxes, instead of remitting the entirety of those sales taxes to the state, can keep a portion of it. We, we have a sales tax vendor credit that we always do for, for timely filing of, of sales taxes. Um, but what the governor has proposed um, is to allow uh, these businesses, any businesses that uh, are getting uh, less than $100,000 per month um, in overall revenue from sales, um, to allow them to keep up to $3,000 a month in the, uh, of that sales tax that they've collected and just hold on to it. They don't need to pay it back. It's essentially a, a subsidy. Um, and under the House amendments, that would be for three months for a total of $9,000 for each of those businesses. Now, of course, there are many businesses in the state that don't charge sales tax because they're services-based businesses, and also many nonprofits that, that need help but don't benefit from the sales taxes. Uh, the Senate tried to deal with that um, by, by adding some additional monies to that $520 million in funding. The House took a slightly different tack um, in trying to make sure that, that everybody got something. The, and this is the provision that most uh, I'm sure most of you on ECM will be most interested in. As you know, in order to fund our unemployment insurance system, businesses uh, uh, pay unemployment insurance taxes. And as you know, those unemployment insurance taxes vary uh, depending on two factors, the experience rating uh, and essentially the, the, the fiscal health of the unemployment insurance trust fund. Um, the governor had proposed, and this bill continues, to essentially give a two-year break on the experience rating to basically say to these businesses, look, if you had to lay people off through no fault of your own because you were told to shut down, um, then we're not going to charge you extra for that, right? In addition to that, though, 
And the House amendments proposed the following, and it's a little complex, so I'm gonna walk you through it. And then the DLS folks, I'm sure would be happy to take any questions you have. The federal government right now, in order to help states to maintain their unemployment insurance trust funds, is lending money to the states at a very low rate of interest. Uh, we sought from the U.S. Department of Labor uh, approval, and, and we have it, uh, to borrow money from the U.S. DOL to sustain the trust fund um, and borrow more than we were expecting to. So that what we'll be able to do is tell any business, any, any employer, I should say, in the state of Maryland that normally pays UI taxes, that they don't have to pay any of those taxes until January of 2022. We're essentially going to defer all UI taxes for any employer of 50 with 50 or fewer employees that wants it for up to a year. Now, at the end of that term, they would have to pay it back. So one way to think of this is as a one-year interest-free loan to every small business and small nonprofit in the state of Maryland for their UI taxes. The worst case scenario, uh, and, and this is not a worst case, it's not a bad case, but it is the worst case scenario, is that... Um, at the end of that time, all of that money would have to be repaid. The best case scenario is that Congress, as part of its stimulus, and this is under consideration, forgives some of those state loans, in which case we would be able potentially to forgive some of the UI taxes for the year. Um, this is worth, if every employer who was eligible took advantage of it, about a billion dollars to Maryland businesses and, and nonprofits. It will cost the state $20 million because all we're on the hook for is the interest payments for the next year. Um, and that, uh, uh, there are some additional technical provisions, which I'm sure DLS folks would be happy to walk through. We had some technical amendments provided by the Comptroller's Office, the Department of Labor, um, uh, some amendments correcting a, uh, a, a, a tax change we made last year to help uh, pass through entities in the state avoid getting hit hard by the uh, reductions in the state and local tax deduction at the federal level. We had to make some technical clarifications there, but um, that is the substance of the bill as amended in Ways and Means earlier today. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Majority Leader. I appreciate it. Um, we will now go to questions. George, will you be, are you the one that's fielding the questions? Mr. Sure, Chair, I can help too. Okay. And Steve Ross. George and Laura. Also. Matter of fact, anybody that want to jump in, feel free to. We'll start with Delegate Charcuti and then go to Delegate Howard, then Delegate Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me start by thanking you, Majority Leader, and the staff who I know have uh, spent an extraordinary amount of time on this and, and some of the members of my committee. I apologize that I don't know who did what, but I'd really appreciate the work that went into this. I have a couple of, um, I have one very specific question actually about utility assistance, and then I have some broader questions. It's I, I think that if I tracked, there's additional money for utility assistance in here. Is that right? Do you know roughly, and do you know roughly how much we're adding to that? Uh, if you give me one moment, I can find that very quickly. Okay, but but between the portion of that is under uh, section 10 of the bill, and that is alone 53 million there. And there are also additional funds under the Recovery Now Fund for that purpose. Okay. I just need to find that exact figure to get you the total. Okay, I believe the total is in the range of 85 million dollars. Okay, right, so that's fantastic. And, the, and I think if I'm following this, and I apologize, we got this this afternoon and then going between the amendments and the bill, I'm not, I just, so if it's obvious in there, um, just bear with me. Um, so I'm trying to figure out if this is going, if this has sort of more flexibility to be distributed. One of the issues I think you're probably aware of is that we have a ton of money sort of sitting there in the LIHEAP money, but the OHEP process is so convoluted and even just trying to get people to be aware of the fact that money's there and then to be aware of um, how to access it and then the multiple steps that go into the application process make it so that we have people who could have gotten that money and their utilities are being turned off. And I've been tracking what's what Virginia's General Assembly did and I've been in conversations with Public Service Commission and Office of People's Council and some of the utilities 
And it looks like there's the possibility maybe of doing it differently. If I, from what I read, it looks like maybe we're able to distribute this in a more flexible way. And I guess I'm just wondering if that's also your understanding and if I might do my follow-up work with PSC um, and OPC and, and support them in that effort, or if there's something that we really would need to be putting in here to make sure that this assistance doesn't get tied to those LIHEAP application processes, which really have been problematic for people to get through. And frankly, we need to address them at some point as a, as a state, but not right this minute. Mr. Chairman, if you want me to try to answer that. Um, Please. Um, so yeah, so there's language in the bill that, uh, and I think Chairman Davis was equally con uh, uh, equally concerned about the uh, sort of internal DHR process. So there's language specifically in the bill for the $83 million that allows the PSC to do block grants directly to the utilities in sort of three buckets. Um, and you know, I'm sure they're happy to have you sort of work with them to figure that out. Um, the first is people who are eligible under OHAP, um, so who are sort of qualify as low income under OHAP, uh, but they don't have to go through the same application process. The utilities would know who uh, is eligible under OHAP and sort of um, be able to direct the funding directly to their arrearages. The second bucket is for um, uh, individuals that the uh, utilities have sort of classified as uh, dis uh, disabled. I think that's the right term. Um, they're like special disabled, I think is the term, is a technical term. And then the third is for um, is for individuals who have had the longest period of arrearages. Um, and if I could just note, I mean, if we, if we sort of figure out a way to get additional money processed through the supplemental budget, Chairman Davis has, has been pretty vocal that he'd like to see this at $100 million based on kind of where the arrearages have grown since, uh, since the pandemic. And so that's something we're continuing to talk to the governor's office about. Okay. Well, thanks, Alex. And thank you, Chairman Davis, for your leadership on that. Um, so it does sound like that has some flexibility. I guess the one of the concerns that I have about the OHEP process that um, has to do, I think, with it being a federal program, but then it's part of what I'm concerned about with this process overall, is I can't quite see where uh, immigrants without social security numbers are helped by this. And I have a huge number of undocumented, but also visa and others who work, pay taxes in the state um, are really suffering right now in my district. And um, it's just been really hard to connect folks with, um, with supports. And I'm just, uh, so potentially the way that this utility system is be, assistance is set up, they, they may become eligible then where they weren't under LIHEAP, um, but, but tying it to the um, EITC the, the payments there, I'm not sure how uh, we plan to help people who are suffering um, through this through this legislation as it's currently written. You're, you're referring to the direct payments and the, the tie, the direct individual payments and the tie to the- Yeah, yeah if I understand the utilities, that, that, that has a possibility of assisting mm -hmm. everybody, but the, but the direct <laughs> payments, now I'm back, so, so sorry, yeah. now I'm jumping back to the bigger picture of the bill. Um, the place that I see the direct payments happening through EITC, I think wouldn't mm -hmm. help um, a lot of people in my community uh, who are suffering right now. And I, I mean, I guess other places like more money for the food banks and stuff, if I'm tracking, that would be helpful, of course. But in terms yeah. of direct payments, I'm just not seeing where that is covered. Yeah, and it's it's a fair criticism, and it's you know something that I'd like to fix um, uh, too. I don't think we can do it in this bill. Um, we are preparing a separate bill to create essentially the same program for folks that have ITINs um, and try to make sure that those subsidies get to the, the folks who need it. So the thought is that we pass this now and then make a commitment to do something else before the end of session to get the other money out? Is that? I'm planning to bring a bill out of my subcommittee on Friday. So soon. Mm -hmm. And do you know if we have the likelihood of getting that out of the Senate as well? I think that that will require some advocacy work, but I think that, look, the reality here is you're right. These are people who desperately need help. This bill does not help that particular group of people. 
Um, and, you know, I, I think, well, um, it's a delicate, you know, as I said, this bill's a compromise um, and compromises are not always what we'd like them to be. Um, but, you know, I, my commitment, at least as subcommittee chairs, I, I, I am planning to bring that bill out of my subcommittee on Friday and to push it vocally. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Delegate Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, again, I really appreciate all the work everybody did. And as a side note, Delegate Lukey, I appreciate your comments when we were on the floor the other day about the the nature of the and spirit of the debate. I appreciated what you had to say there. Um, and I believe in it wholeheartedly. So I guess my question is, is that when we're talking about, let's say these uh, extra monies for MEMA to be dispersed to volunteer fire departments, right? And this really kind of goes down the line as far as these payments are concerned. It talks about the grant process, but are we distributing those evenly throughout the state or like Alex, you talked a little bit about some of this arrearage money sort of going to areas where these arrearages are, are more dense, I guess, is, a, is the word I'm looking for. And um, or, or is that just going to be evenly the large portion of these funds? Because we're talking about a lot of money. Is that going to be evenly distributed? I know it's through the grants process. And I'm sorry if this track question isn't really tracking. But uh, so... The answer to your question is the Senate added specific language that said as much as possible that the money should be distributed um, proportionally. Now, clearly, there are some programs. Uh, I mean, for example, in my county, the volunteer fire departments tend to be concentrated in one part of the county. So the money right. and the appropriations for that will go more to that one part of the county. Rural broadband funds go more towards rural areas. So there are some specific funds that will end up sort of concentrated by the nature of what they are. Uh, but the Senate did intentionally add language that says that to the extent possible, um, the uh, grants in various programs should be distributed according. I, mean. I did initially, but since Lidke wrapped up quicker than I thought, maybe not, question mark. Uh, Thanks. Chris, are Thanks, you Chris, for that. you having your own conversation? <laughs> Thanks, Chris, for that. Thank you, Delegate. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, Mr. it. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add on to that. So part of the way that this whole deal is structured is it would be up to the governor, right, to actually process the budget amendment that would come to the legislature while we're in session. So while there aren't sort of a, there isn't a particular formula um, around the volunteer fire companies or any or any of the money. And that's kind of what I was getting at. To see it when they process the budget amendment. Okay, and that's kind of what I was getting at. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Delegate Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So a couple of uh, quick questions. One, when you say the business owners uh, will be allowed to keep a portion of the sales tax they collect, will that include uh, like alcohol and tobacco taxes that they collect? Like restaurants, you know, they obviously get money off their alcohol tax. Are they being allowed to, to keep? So, uh, George, the, so not, not the alcohol excise tax, right? Anything that's, that's paid before the alcohol actually gets to the, the point of sale, it would not be. But George, the 9% Alcohol tax. Alcohol. That's a sales and use tax. So right. that would be available open, assuming that they are eligible for the vendor credit. As in so they, they would remit, you know, under the cap of six thousand dollars in a given month. So so they would be so they'd be eligible to qualify. Yes. Yeah. Um the Miss Bitfa grants, um, the parts where they can forgive some of the they can turn some of the loans in the grants. Is that or is that for loans given out during a certain time frame or is this going how far back is this going that pertains to financing that's provided during fiscal years 2021 and 2022 okay. for the purpose of relieving adverse effects of the coronavirus pandemic that's fine and then uh, just two more quick ones could you there was a part where you were talking about income levels i believe it was under uh, unemployment insurance premium or something like that where our I heard fifty thousand um, dollars and a hundred thousand joint. Can you can you give me those breakdowns again? Sure. So the the deduction for unemployment right now, all unemployment benefits are taxed yeah. income. Yeah. Right. Um, we would say that if your total income and you were filing as an individual is seventy five thousand or less, or if your joint income, if you're filing jointly, is a hundred thousand dollars or less, that you could exempt 
uh, basically take a, a, a subtraction modification, a deduction for all of the UI benefits that you receive. So that, and that's, and that has nothing to do with like, you know, number of people in a household or anything of that nature. It's just purely. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just based on joint or, or, uh, or singly. So somebody that's a family, one income is 55,000, two people making 55,000. They've been hit hard during this one. They just were not doing anything for them. Um, they wouldn't receive a benefit under this component now. Um, okay. And then last thing, is there a way that if the federal government does give Maryland uh, some money and they forgive Maryland's portion of it, can we make it mandatory that we as a state automatically forgive the people that we've given the loans out to as well? It's like the federal government scratching our back. Why aren't we scratching uh, the citizens of Maryland's back? Under the, you mean under the, the UI program that we were talking about? No, I'm talking about uh, the program that we got money from the federal government from to help out with the this. So if and I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I think we're all hoping and it's a good chance that the federal government may forgive the money. So mm -hmm. anybody that was a beneficiary of the money we gave out, I know we talked about establishing the loan program. Well, if the federal government, why don't we mandate if the federal government forgives uh, the state of Maryland, then the state of Maryland should forgive the people we loan the money out to. Um, Laura, I don't know if you have, or George, thoughts on that. I mean, I, we will be in session before the money would be due. We will be in session again, but. The money would be due in G the end of January, 2022. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose you could add a contingency to say, you know, if, if the, oh, the, secretary has, the secretary has been saying for many months that she's been asking for the loans to be, you know, forgiven yeah. to the state. So I don't know how realistic it is. I know that everyone's very hopeful, but um, you know, I it wasn't discussed in the work group. I don't believe whether to include language like to that effect. Uh, Laura, I like your language on contingent. Make it contingent. If it is a contingency plan. If it works, then you know we talked about it before with utilities. You know, if utility company gets help, then they should help out the rate payer. So. Thank you so much. All right, Delegate Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Delegate Lukey, um, I appreciate all the work as everybody else does, but I didn't hear anything mentioned in here, and, I, and it's a big part of our group, is about seniors. Are they, where do they picked up in this bill? Um, so seniors as a group are not specifically targeted in either the original version of the bill or the, the, the bill as it's come through either chamber. Um, there are, of course, seniors that would benefit in various ways. So there are plenty of seniors that qualify, that continue to work and qualify for the earned income tax credit. Um, there are certainly seniors that are working that will get benefit from the UI exemption. Um, and of course, any senior who's a business owner would be able to take advantage of any of the business programs. But As well as rate relief. As, yes, as well as rate relief. So I think, I think it's important to message that, that we get this out there because sometimes when we, we deal with it, we hear that. The other thing in here, and this is just something that came up in, in subcommittee today, UI is going to be is allocated $3 million in hire, new hires. And throughout this whole pandemic, we've, we've dealt with UI and we've listened to the infinite number of hires that they've had over there. Is this broken down some way in addition to what they currently are, are employing or are they going to try and segment get rid of some people as this unemployment situation goes away. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if Laura or Alex or. So just to be clear, um, the, the funding outside of any of the education funding, um, the funding that's contained in the budget amendments that the governor will be processing is for the remainder of this fiscal year. Um, so it's essentially $3 million, which, you know, if you sort of extrapolate, um, I know DLS was working on exact numbers. I don't know if Steve Ross is on, um, if he had any actual numbers, but $3 million to hire contractual um, people to help a dollar with the UI for, I guess, the remaining five months of the fiscal year is a lot of people. Um, so yeah, I know they were, that the Senate was working with DLS trying to get an exact number, but it should, it should significantly assist um, the Department of Labor in helping to staff up. I, I, my point is, I think throughout this whole thing with, with UI and the payment as far as the issues we've had with unemployment, that every time we have a meeting, they're hiring people, they're hiring people. 
it seems like we've hired, I don't know how big the body is right now. And that's why I was sitting back saying, how are we transform those people that we've hired? Hopefully that will get lesser and lesser and they'll merge those people. That's where I was trying to come from. Yes, we did get some follow up on that um, <clears throat> from the uh, subcommittee meeting until now. They hired, they have roughly a thousand people underneath contracts, like, but not a contractual employee. They hired, they moved a hundred state employees over, and then they have 97 contractual staff kind of working for them directly right now. So that's like the universe of what they uh, told us that they've kind of increased their staffing. All right. Thank uh, you. For baseline, you're looking at 350 to 400 people there. Last year, when you look at that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Crosby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to piggyback off of Delegate Howard, I just wanted to make sure it's kind of a niche issue for me that the uh, volunteer rescue squads made it into the bill. Uh, I know that was something that was called for in the Senate. So the, the final version of the budget proposal, so the appropriation side of this whole thing, I think provides $4 million for the volunteer fire departments and rescue squads. Okay, thank you. Delegate Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was um, reading the, the memo that the hospitality industry sent us specifically from the Restaurant Association and just there were a lot of ideas in that memo. Um, three of them I thought m maybe made some sense and I'm wondering if you were able to consider that those at all or whether you want me to mention which ones I'm talking about. Yeah, I, um, so I've been talking with the Restaurant Association throughout this, um, obviously, because they've been hit so hard. Um, right. And, um, you know, I, there are, they will certainly be able to benefit from the sales tax um, vendor credit. They'll be able to benefit from the UI thing. They have additional proposals, which, you know, I, I are, are worth discussing. Um, you know, some of them will be in your committee and some of them in mine, right? So, for example, so the vendor, asked, can you just explain the vendor credit again? I mean, it's, it's sure. what part of it is new is, is what I'm asking. So what part of it is new? So um, over uh, the three months uh, of following this bill's um, passage, any business that collects sales tax uh, and has total sales of under $100,000 a year. Um, so essentially, you know, targeting, and that was in the governor's original proposal, very targeted at smaller businesses, um, would be collecting, let's say if you, you had exactly $100,000 a, a, a month in sales, you'd be collecting $6,000 a month. Instead of remitting $6,000 back to the state in sales right. tax, three. I got it. I'm sorry, De um, Delegate Lukey. I think we were talking about two different things. And um, on the sales tax credit, Revenues of less than 100,000 won't, uh, most hospitality businesses are going to be more than that. But what I was asking about or meant to ask about was the sales tax vendor timely filing discount. Uh, yeah. That was so one that of the not, things they yeah, had. That's not addressed about. in this bill. Okay. Is it something you think we can get addressed somewhere else? Can I, can I say something? I have that. I, I'm sorry. I don't want to enter, but just to answer Delegate Watson's I'm in discussions with the benefit B retailers, all the, and I have that, essentially I have that bill. It's got some other things into it, but I'm watching this very closely and what the governor and the Senate and what the house is gonna do on this relief bill, because some of the portions of this bill are in a bill that I have, but the, the timely filing credit that you're talking about, increasing that timely, timely right. discount because they're paying more to pay by credit card than they're receiving. I have that bill, and that, I think that's scheduled to be heard on March 11th. So, just okay. FYI, thank you. All right. Thank you. And then um, restoring the energy sales tax exemption for restaurants—that is something that is not going to be in this bill, obviously. But I, I have that also in that <laughs> bill that I have drafted. Okay. And again, that's why I'm watching this very closely because I'm sure, hopefully, God, that bill moves forward we'll probably have to cut some portions out of that bill because they're already addressed in this bill and vice versa, so. All right, so Look, are it, you did, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, I think most of these proposals have been um, proposed through separate bills. Um, you know, the, while they're not necessarily included in this bill, um, you know, if we have the room in the budget, particularly if there's a federal stimulus that comes through with state funding, 
um, we'll be able to do a lot more of these kinds of things. Okay, I just want to sure that it stays on the radar. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Delegate Brooks. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Delegate Lukey, on the, on the, I'm picking back off of uh, the question that uh, Delegate uh, uh, Walker asked. Ask, uh, on that $50,000 $100,000 uh, uh, income uh, for one, 50 for one, uh, 100000 for two, you, you won't have to pay uh, UI taxes on it. Is that uh, gross income or is that taxable income? Um, it should be FAGI, right? George? Federal adjusted gross income. And it was yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And it's right. and it's seventy five. It's seventy five thousand for individuals, not fifty. Seventy five thousand for individuals, hundred thousand for for jobs. Oh, seventy five. Oh, okay. All right. So, is there, is there at the end of the, if you get over that, is there a drop off or is there a phase out? It's it's a cliff. A cliff. Got it. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Delegate Chi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, if there's anything in particular for the first responders in addition to the volunteer firefighters that I heard mentioned. In the uh, appropriations portion of the bill, I do not know. Okay. There is not. I think uh, part of the thinking, and again, this was a uh, Senate proposal that the volunteer fire <laughs> left out of the original two uh, federal bills. Um, and so I think that's why they're trying to backfill some money to the volunteer fire companies now. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else before I go back to um, second bite at the apple? Delegate Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually thought I, uh, we made a mistake, but now I'm hearing again so it's seventy five thousand for a single and a hundred thousand for a couple. Yes. Why? Why those numbers? Yeah. Or or why do? I mean, the, it, it would be if it's seventy five thousand. Why are we going seventy five and one fifty? Or you know, I've seen times we've gone seventy five one twenty five, but you know, it's like you know, I yeah. I mean, it, it's taking into account household size stuff like that. We said we're not. So why are we doing seventy five single? So you're telling me right now, two teachers, and you know a lot about this, uh, Delphi Luke, being a teacher, if you're making 55,000, 60,000, you get some hardship, you're not eligible for this? That's so the generally, you know, in, in the tax law, we, we, we don't just double the individual numbers to get to the joint numbers. Um, and that's because of economies of scale, right? I mean, the- It's never that far off though, 75 to 100. That's from what I remember, we would, you know, I've seen 75 go 125. I haven't seen 75 compared to 100. No, I mean, that, that's- was there, a reason, was there a rationale behind that? They were the, so part the, of it, Delegate Lukey, yeah. if I can, part, part of the issue here is we had a sort of budgetary, like a maximum budgetary amount that we could spend. The way that this, the, the um, bill is currently structured leaves us at around, and some budget person chime in, I think we're around $68 million in fund balance. Uh, and so we basically came at this backwards, right? This is the universe of about $1.3 billion that we have to spend. And we allocated it in different ways based on different pots of money of the agreements that sure. we strike with the governor and the Senate. I, I understand that. What portion, can I ask this? What portion of the money do we have earmarked for this particular program? Mm, is there some budget person on here? We, we can find out for you, Delegate Walker. George, do you remember the original is there, is portion there for that room on this? I mean, you know. I need to pull the fiscal note to see the original estimate. However, as it is amended, it would cost roughly $185 million for fiscal 21. 185? I mean, is there, is yes. it about a huge packet? Is there wiggle room on this one to maybe take care of families that are being hit twice as hard? My guess is it's probably settled. I mean, remember, this isn't just a house bill. This is sort of the end product of negotiations with the governor and Senate. I, I think it, if we start messing with the numbers, it, it sort of starts to unravel everything if you want to be perfectly honest. I mean, if it's not up for discussion, I got you. But like you said, you know, the areas, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, 
just out loud. You take Montgomery County, Prince George's County, which has a, probably the highest cost of living in the state, in Baltimore and as well. You talk about two million people and we've got families and we've said it time and time again, you make you know $50,000 in those regions, you are struggling. And if you've got a family trying to combine income so you can save and do well, then you know, in the benefits. So I think it's worth fighting for, look, taking a look at, and um, let me know. But I know it's been tough and appreciate the work y'all have attempted to do. Uh, anyone else? If not, thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. I, I appreciate your work on this. Certainly, uh, uh, Mr. Butler and, of course, Laura, um, you guys did a great job. It was, it, it was certainly um, a, my pleasure working with you all on this on behalf of the state of Maryland. As was mentioned, did everything's perfect or, or everything we'd like? Uh, no, that's probably seldom the case. But the question for something like this is if you pull if you add to one thing, it means you've got to pull from someplace else. And that creates a whole nother set of issues for the advocates on, on those particular points. So I certainly get it, Steve. I didn't mean to leave you out either, Steve Ross. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. I think we need to commence to, to um, moving on this. And did have you, have you guys voted, Eric, uh, Delegate Lukey? Yeah, Ways and Means voted unanimously earlier today. Okay. Um, well, then let's go ahead and get started so we can get this uh, hopefully out and, and they can, we could begin debate on this tomorrow, uh, floor debate tomorrow. So with that, um, uh, uh, is, Denise, are you with us? And I, yes, Bob and I are here. Yes. All right, is, is everybody, um, that from a staffing standpoint that need to be on, on? Yes. All right, so Senate Bill 496, is there, do we well, need to do amendments? Amendment. Yeah. Second. You need Second the amendments? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. On the amendments, there's a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 All those Aye. opposed say nay. Uh, the Aye. amendments carry. Is there a motion on the bill move, as amended? Move the bill as amended. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded for a, a favorable as amended for Senate Bill 496. Um, all right, I'm going to try this. I don't have a roll sheet in front of me, but I think I might have this. So. Denise, you be ready to, um, to to record this, and if I miss anybody, please uh, please Did jump in. So, Alrighty. I'm, I'm gonna try to do this from memory. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Delegate Brooks. Aye. Uh, Delegate Turner. Aye. Oh, you miss me. Delegate. Who did I miss? Queen. Delegate Queen. Yes. Fisher. Delegate Fisher. Is Delegate Fisher with us? All right. Um, That's him. That's him. Maybe. <laughs> well, I can't take it by phone call, so I will keep going. Delegate Carey. Yes. Rogers. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate in Polaria. He was, he's here. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Delegate in Polaria is a yes. Jackson. Delegate Jackson. Yes. Pippi. Delegate Pippi. Yes. Uh, who? Mouts. Delegate Mouts? Yes. Yes. Uh, Delegate Wilson? I'm, I'm after Warren, uh, Mr. Chair. He ain't here. <laughs> I'll, I'll get his vote later. <laughs> yes. Delegate Branch? Yep. 
Delegate Valderrama? Aye. Delegate T? Yes. Oh. East Gilbert. Oh. Jay. Who? Jay. Walker. Delegate Walker. Uh, I'm. I'm gonna say. I hope we do. I hope we do more. You did a decent job early on getting the vote out right, D, but then you started missing. So Denise has been carrying you. So you're having a bad one. But I'm voting. <laughs> Everybody I'm, I'm voting. pretty. I'm hoping we do more. I hope we do more. I'm gonna vote yes as a start, but we should do more. That's fair. Do we get Delegate Chi? Yes. Okay. Um, Delegate Charcutian. Yes. Adams. Delegate Adams. Aye. Delegate Howard. Aye. Curly. Uh, who? Curly. Curly. Oh, Delegate Aaron. Oh, that's what you called for, but aye. <laughs> Fennell. Diana, yeah. Delegate yeah, Fennell. Yes. Crosby. Um, Delegate Crosby. Aye. And Delegate Watson. Aye. All right. That said, did anyone get missed? Do we we don't see Delegate uh, Fisher here? Where is Fisher? We'll mark Delegate Fisher as excused. Delegate Davis. I vote aye. Good job, B. 23 to 1 when excused. 2301, right? 2301. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. No well, nays, no is, abstentions. Yeah. Thank you guys uh, very much. You um, motion carries on that bill. You'll be hearing more from us um, regarding some subcommittee things. Uh, subcommittee. Yeah. Subcommittee uh, uh, things will be coming up soon. I'll be also be meeting with subcommittee chairs. We, we've got some work to do. I believe it's tomorrow, is it? Yes, tomorrow at 11. Tomorrow at 11 is subcommittee chairs. Uh, or, or immediately after session, since we have a session. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. Or immediately following session. That no, Delegate Aaron. Yep. Yeah. Then we, then we have bill hearings, and then we have session, and then we continue the bill hearing. Tomorrow. Long Correct. day tomorrow. Long day Mr. tomorrow, guys. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, um, business regs was supposed to meet tomorrow. It was, should we try to plan that for another day? Laura? Mr. Chair, it's up to you and the subcommittee chair, but I mean, it does seem our schedule is going to be a little tight with the double floor sessions. And What time were you all scheduled to meet? 12.30. 12.30. 12.30. Nah, that, that didn't go. That's not going that, to that, happen. Yeah. All right. So, Laura, we'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll text you. We'll have to figure out another time. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, guys. Have a good evening. Uh, be careful uh, of the weather if it comes to fruition. And um, I'll see you guys tomorrow. See everybody right. tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Going in Rockville. All right. Wow. This. Yes. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Where am I?